Hello everybody, this is my lecture for uh, Wednesday, March 18. So uh, today uh, we will go over one example to design a double pipe heat exchanger and then we will go over design con consideration of Shaw and TOP exchangers. So uh, here is example you are asked to design a double pipe heat exchanger and so the hot fluid is water with the inlet temperature of 195 Fahrenheit and the mass flow is a 5,000 pound mass per hour and then the exit temperature is, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, exit temperature is unknown and then the other uh, fluid, the cold one is uh, trialing glycol EG with the temperature of 85 Fahrenheit and then the mass flow rate of 12,000 pound mass per hour. Also, you have the, uh, you know, information, some information, you know, for the uh, pipe and annulus, you know, sizes and then the tube size is, you know, 20 feet. Now, you are asked to find the outlet temperature of ethylene glycol. So, to design each and every heat exchanger, the first step you need to find uh, thermophysical properties. To find the thermophysical properties, you need to have the reference temperature. So, normally, reference temperature is average temperature between inlet and exit temperature. So, here, both two exit temperatures are unknown. So uh, what you can do, you can start uh, from the inlet temperature. You can calculate the average temperature in the inlet, and then you can use this temperature to find the thermophysical properties. This is the first step, you know, to just find all thermophysical uh, properties. Now, uh, so before I solve, you know, uh, this problem, I'm going to uh, provide you a general picture of this problem. You are asked to find the outlet temperature. Craig. So, um, if you remember from my previous lectures, uh, there are two cases, you know, for the uh, exit temperature. Sometimes there is one unknown uh, exit temperature. So, in these cases, if you have one uh, unknown exit temperature, you can simply use the energy balance between hot and cold fluid, and then you can find the, uh, you know, unknown, uh, you know, uh, temperature. Here, two temperatures are unknown. For the two unknown temperatures, uh, if you remember, you can use those, you know, correlations that we develop for counter flow or parallel flow. For counter flow, you can use this equation to find the T2 and also this uh, equation to find the exit temperature of cold fluid. So you need to have R and E counter. R is the ratio of M dot CP of cold fluid over M dot CP of hot fluid. So all these informations are available, M dot CP for both two fluids. So you can simply find the R. So to find the E counter for the counter flow, you can use this correlation. So to find the um, E counter, you need to have the heat transfer coefficient, the overall heat transfer coefficient, and the area to calculate, you know, the uh, e counter. So we need to calculate the overall heat transfer coefficient, but how? To calculate the overall heat transfer coefficient, you need to start from that long equation that you learned in chapter 11, Bergman. So uh, this is the equation. Um, there is no information for the fouling. You can assume that, you know, this is a new heat exchanger, so you can cancel, you know, fouling for both two, you know, sides. Also, uh, you can assume that, you know, the uh, uh, conduction thermal resistance is negligible, and then you can cancel all these three, you know, terms. And simply, you can use this equation to find the overall heat transfer coefficient. This is the overall heat transfer coefficient, guys, based on the AO. So, uh, uh, what you need to do, you need to find the heat transfer coefficient for both two fluids, hot and cold fluid. Okay, so this is a big picture. You are asked to find the exit temperature. To find the exit temperature, you need to have R and E counter. R is now E counter. To find the E counter, you need to uh, find the overall heat transfer coefficient. And for the overall heat transfer coefficient, you need to find H, I, and H. Oh, so we need to find the heat transfer coefficient. 
Okay, so uh, to find the heat transfer coefficient, um, let's just go back, you know, to the uh, different steps to design a heat exchanger. So the first step to design each and every heat exchanger is determination of thermophysical properties. The second step, you need to find diameters plus, you know, areas. So uh, the, uh, actually, you can use two different methods to find this information. For the method one, you can use table F2. You have, you know, a standard size of, you know, uh, annulus and, uh, you know, a pipe. So you can use table F2 to find IDA, IDP, and ODP. For the areas, you can simply calculate the area for the pipe and area for the annulus. This is the first method, guys, to find, you know, the uh, IDA, IDP, and, you know, areas for the pipe and, and annulus. Now, you have the flow area for the pipe. Here you can see that the area, the flow area of annulus is higher. So because the flow area of annulus is higher, so EG or ethylene glycol flows in annulus because ethylene glycol has higher, you know, mass flow rate. So we also accommodate, you know, uh, two fluids. So water will be in pipe and uh, ethylene glycol uh, flow in annulus. So this is the first method to find, you know, the areas. The second method to find the areas, you can use table A3. And here we are lucky because we have actually this combination in this table, you know, two by one quarter inches. So look, guys, everything is available here. You have the annulus, uh, IDA, IDP, ODP, you have the dehydrolate, the equivalent, everything is available in this table. So this is the first method to find the areas. Also, you need to find the dehydrolate and, you know, the equivalent. So if you use the table A3, you are good. You can just report, you know, these values for the dehydrolate and equivalent. Otherwise, you can determine the dehydrolate and the equivalent from the definition of dehydrolate and the equivalent. You know, we already discussed this equation, you know, for dehydrolate and the equivalent, you know, in uh, double pipe heat exchangers. Okay, so this is the first, the second method to find the dihydrolate and the equivalent. Now, you have all dimensions. You have, you know, uh, areas, diameters, and, you know, um, uh, yeah, flow areas and, you know, diameters. Now, the next step, you need to find the heat transfer coefficients. To, to find the heat transfer coefficient, you need to find the Nusselt number. And Nusselt number depends on the Reynolds number and Prontel number. You already found the Prontel number, so we need to find the Reynolds number. So, to find the Reynolds number for the water, keep in your mind that you need to use the IDP, correct? But for the ethylene glycol, because you are going to use this Reynolds number to find the Nusselt number, you need to use the D equivalent. Correct. So this is the D equivalent. So based on this information, you can find the Reynolds number and then you can see that both two fluids flow are turbulent. Now, so we can just pick, you know, right equation to find the nozzle number. Okay. So, uh, yeah, you have, you know, the Reynolds number, you have the Prontel number, you can just find the um, nozzle number so keep in your mind that for the water because water is you know being actually cooled so the uh, n is 0.3 here and for the ethylene glycol is 0.4 and then you can find the you know nozzle number now you have the nozzle number you can find the h the heat transfer coefficient by using this equation but Keep in your mind that for the water, this diameter is IDP, and for the ethylene glycol, this diameter is uh, the equivalent, correct? Okay. Yeah, look, for water, you need to use the IDP, and for ethylene glycol, you need to use the equivalent. So you can find HIHO. Now you have the heat transfer coefficient, and... Uh, by using this equation, you can find the overall heat transfer coefficient. Now you have the overall heat transfer coefficient. You can find E counter, and then from the E counter, you can find the exit temperatures. The exit temperatures are now. Now, you found the exit temperatures. 
right? This is the exit temperature for water, and then this is the exit temperature for ethylene glycol. Now you are able to find the actual uh, T average, correct? We use the T average of 140. Look here in the beginning of you know my uh, PowerPoint, right here. I use you know 140. If you calculate the new actual you know T average by using this you know two temperatures that you found for the exit temperature, you will see that you know the difference between this 140 and the new uh, you know T average is less than you know I think 70. Uh, Fahrenheit. So, and this is negligible. If you calculate the, you know, uh, thermophysical properties based on the new, uh, you know, uh, T average. So, the thermophysical properties, you know, uh, almost constant for this, you know, temperature difference. So, you are good. You don't need to repeat this process. If your exit temperature is more than, you know, 100, you know, Fahrenheit or something around 50, you know, degrees centigrade, then you need to just repeat, you know, this actually, you know, process. But for this case, you are good. This is uh, one point. The other thing is that, guys, you need to report an Excel file. You need to add all this information to a, an Excel file, and then you need to report this Excel file as your actual, you know, desired calculation. I prepare an Excel file, and then I share it on the Blackboard. Um, so, uh, yeah. This is the Excel file, guys. You can see, you know, the Excel file. So, uh, the first part is the fluid properties. I just add the fluid properties, tube size. You can add the tube size. And then the next step, uh, you need to find the fluid velocities, correct? So for the fluid velocities, you need to have the M dot densities, AP and A for the annulus. You can find the velocities. And then here, you know, I just found the Reynolds number. So uh, then the Nusselt numbers, H I H O and the overall heat transfer coefficient and then eventually you know I just calculate the capacitance now and then I calculate you know the uh, outlet temperature for the outlet temperature I just uh, anticipate two you know cases counter flow and parallel flow here you know the problem is counter flow so you don't need to just use this power I just try to prepare a general format, you know, to design a heat exchange. So it's just, I accumulate everything, you know, in this file. Now, look guys, this is not the end of actually process. What you need to do, you need to calculate the delta P and you need to make sure that the delta P is less than, you know, 70 kilopascal or 10 PSI. Also, you need to, uh, you know, check the heat balance, you know, in uh, heat exchange, you need to make sure that QC equals the QH equals the Q that you uh, can calculate from the NTU method or log mean temperature difference method. So what you need to do, you, uh, as you can see here, I calculate the QC by using the cold uh, fluid information by using the M dot CP delta T for the cold fluid. And also I calculate the QH M dot CP uh, delta T for the hot fluid and also I determine Q by using the NTU method and as you can see here you know Q is the same by using all these three you know different methods meaning that you are good meaning that you know uh, there is a heat bounce you know in your heat exchanger so uh, in some cases you may have fouling factor Correct. Then you need to add information for the fouling factor. You know, in this part, I just add this part again, guys, to make a general, you know, uh, format. And then the last part, you need to calculate the delta P, and then you need to make sure that the delta P is less than, you know, uh, 70 kilopascal. So. What you need to do, you need to calculate the Reynolds number. Keep in your mind that the Reynolds number in this part can be different from you know Reynolds number that you that you use to determine the Nusselt number why because here you need to use the hydraulic diameter guys correct the hydraulic diameter to calculate the Reynolds number so the Reynolds number for pipe 
is the same for both you know a nozzle number and friction factor why because for pipe we can write uh, d hydraulic equals the d equivalent equals the di uh, idp so i assume that this is a smooth pipe epsilon is zero and then i found the friction factor i use the moody's diagram guys but i recommend you guys to just modify this part i uh, use you know those correlations that you learn you know in uh fluid mechanics uh to calculate the fp this is much better you know um to just make sure that you know you have everything you know uh, in this file so then i calculate the reynolds number for annulus so keep in your mind that guys again here we need to use the dehydrolate to calculate the reynolds number and then this is the friction factor so i calculate the pressure the delta p in both pipe and annulus and as you can see the delta p is less than 10 psi you know in both two actually you know sections in pipe and annulus so you are good uh, uh, look guys you must calculate the pressure drop if your pressure drop is more than 10 psi you must change guys you know your uh, uh, design criteria to make sure that the delta p is less than uh, 10 psi please keep this file guys uh, you will use i will ask you guys to modify this file for uh shell and tube heat exchanger and for you know plate and frame heat exchanger so you need to keep this file you can change it a little bit you know for the other type of heat exchanger and then you can use it to for the uh individual project and also you know for your group project or for any other you know uh, you know project in your you know future career okay so uh let's see we done this part and then now we can start the uh next part okay let's start chapter nine uh from journal textbook design consideration for shell and tube heat exchangers so uh if you remember from the previous part so uh, normally if you need high higher surface area you should use the double uh, uh, shell and tube heat exchanger and this is the case when you have low flow rates or moderate temperature if you have low flow rates or moderate temperature difference then you need to use higher you know for constant q you need to use higher uh, surface area so in this case you should actually shift switch from um, double pipe heat exchanger to shell and tube heat exchanger so the number of tubes sometimes is even more uh, higher than thousand you know tubes so uh yeah we will discuss you know this detail keep in your mind that you know for the shell and tube heat exchanger normally we use a baffle to increase mixing you know in the uh you know uh, shell side uh, to increase the heat transfer you know rate now Piping and tubing standards, generally speaking, you know, this is the general, you know, uh, actually part, you know, for the piping and tubing uh, standards. So for the pipes, normally we use a nominal diameter and a schedule number to report a specification of a pipe. For example, we can report two nominal a schedule 40. The nominal diameter is different from the, you know, uh, IDP or ODP. It's totally different, can be, you know, different from the ODP and IDP. Keep in your mind that each nominal diameter uh, specify a one and only one outside diameter. Uh, the schedule number actually represents the thickness of the wall. So the higher schedule number means the thicker, you know, wall. So normally we use a schedule 40 to design uh, shell and tube heat exchangers or, you know, in for the common, you know, application in engineering. So, uh, yeah, for example, you can use table D1, you know, for the specification of different, you know, pipes. And here, for example, you can see for, uh, you know, one nominal diameter, the outside diameter is 1.315 uh, inches. And uh, as you can see, you know, depending on the schedule, there are uh, four different, you know, inside diameter and as you can see the inside diameter decreases as the schedule increases meaning that the thickness increases correct so for a, a very high pressure you know application you can use 
pipes with higher schedule numbers. For the water tubing, we already discussed it, you know, for uh, double pipe heat exchanger, normally you can use, uh, we have three types of, uh, you know, tubes, K, L, and M. For heat exchanger, normally we use, you know, M, the soldered, you know, fittings. So, uh, for the water tubing, normally we use a standard diameters and a type. So, uh, the standard term diameter, guys, again, is different, you know, from the uh, IDP or, you know, ODP and the type, you may have K, L, or M. You can use table D2 uh, in this part. Uh, you know, for the uh, uh, actual specification of different, you know, uh, tubes. Here you can see, for example, for one standard size, uh, for example, type K, type M, you know, uh, it has, you know, this, you know, inside diameter, 0 0.08792. Okay, now, uh, heat transfer rate. So for the heat transfer rate, if you use the LMTD method, you can write Q equals the UAF LMTD. U is the overall heat transfer coefficient. We discussed in chapter 11 different methods to calculate the U. If you assume that the uh, heat exchanger is clean, is clean or a new one, you can cancel the fouling factor. Also, you know, you can cancel the uh, thermal resistance due to conduction, and then what you need to do, you just need to find HI, HO, you need to have the OD for the tube, ID for the tube, and then you can find the overall heat transfer coefficient. For the dirty heat exchanger, you need to have the fouling factors, and then you can use this equation to find the overall heat transfer coefficient. What is the AO? AO is the total heat uh, transfer area. So to calculate the total heat transfer area, you can calculate the heat transfer area of one tube and then you can multiply it by the number of tubes. So here you can see pi ODTL is the uh, area of one tube and then you can multiply it by N, number of tubes. What is the F? So F, we already discussed it in chapter 11. This is the correction factor. You can use uh, figures 11S1 to 11S4 to find the F, right? So for example, here you can see the figure 11S1. Now, keep in your mind that this is really important. To design each and every uh, shell and tube heat exchanger, you need to calculate F. And then you need to make sure that the F is higher than 0.75. If F is less than 0.75, it means that your heat exchanger is operating in a costly mode. You need to redesign your heat exchanger. So you must calculate F, and then you need to make sure that F is higher than 0.75. If F is less than 0.75, just you need, you need to redesign your heat exchanger. So I just add, you know, this figure, you know, from different resources. This is the... Uh, uh, you know, figure to find the uh, correction factor from Jana textbook. This is from the Changel. So you can use, you know, these figures to find the uh, correction factor. And then also, guys, you can use the NTU method to find the uh, Q. So this is, you know, the uh, correlation to find the heat transfer rate. Also, you can write the um, uh, you know, Q for the cold fluid and Q for the hot fluid. You can write Q equals to the M dot CP delta T for the cold fluid and also M dot CP for the, you know, hot fluid. Delta M dot CP times delta T for the hot fluid side. So temperatures. If you have one unknown temperature, just use the energy balance between hot and cold fluid to find the unknown temperature. If you have two unknown temperatures, again, you can set three equations. You can set the equation for the Q equals to the M dot CP delta T for the cold fluid, M dot CP for uh, delta T for the hot fluid, and then uh, UAF log mean temperature difference. And then if you solve these three equations, simultaneously, it is possible, you know, uh, to find the exit temperature by using this procedure. So first you need to find R. 
What is the R? R is the M dot CP for the cold fluid over M dot CP of hot fluid. Correct? So normally M dot CP and actually M dot CP for both two fluids must be known. The second step, calculate UA over M dot CP for the cold fluid. So you need to have the U. If U overall heat transfer coefficient is unknown, you need to find overall heat transfer coefficient. You saw that, you know, in uh, example, in the beginning of my lecture, we determine U, the overall heat transfer coefficient for that double pipe heat exchange. You need to follow the same procedure to calculate the, you know, U. Uh, uh, for, you know, a uh, Schollen tube heat exchanger, but keep in your mind that the correlation uh, can be a little bit, you know, different. So uh, by having these two terms, UA over M dot CP and R, you can use this figure, figure 913, to find S, right? You have this term, you have R, you can simply find, for example, S. Now you have the S, you can substitute into this equation to find T2, which is the exit temperature of cold, Floyd. Now you have the T2, you can substitute in the equation for the R, and then you can find the exit temperature of hot Floyd. Okay, now design of tube sites. For the tube site, we will go over materials, orientation, and maximum number of tubes. For the materials, you know, we can use, you know, different materials you know, for the, you know, uh, tube. Normally copper is, you know, best option because of, you know, high, you know, uh, heat transfer coefficient. So there are different, you know, standards. The most common one is the BWG, you know, uh, a standard. And then you can use table 9.2 to find the, you know, uh, OD and ID of different, you know, uh, actually, you know, uh, BWG, you know, pipes, right? So, uh, for the tube orientation, there are three different, you know, tube orientation. S square, you know, orientation, S square rotated or triangular. So, uh, to design a heat exchange, you need to pick one of these three, you know, actually, you know, uh, uh, tube orientation. And also, also, you need to find a uh, actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, pitch size, you know, the distance between the two adjacent, you know, uh, pipes, correct? This is called tube pitch. So, uh, yeah. Now, to design any uh, double pipe uh, shell and tube heat exchanger, you need to find the maximum number of tubes in a shell. Why the maximum number of to, we use the maximum number of tube to maximize the surface, the, uh, the uh, heat transfer area, and then to maximize the heat transfer rate. So to find the maximum number of tubes in a shell, it depends to several factors. Depends to the tube, uh, the shell size, correct? The bigger shell size, the more number of uh, tubes. It also depends on the t uh, tube, you know, uh, size, correct? The smaller tube size, the more number of, you know, uh, tubes. It depends to the tube orientation. It depends to, the, you know, uh, actually, uh, pitch size, right? It depends to, uh, let's see if I mention everything, number of passes. It also depends on the number of passes, correct? So based on this information, you can use table 9 tree to find the maximum number of uh, tubes. Uh, here you can see, for example, this part is, you know, uh, shell ID. Then for the one passes, two passes, four passes, different passes. Then this section is for three quarter inches of, you know, OD tube. And then also for S square uh, with a pitch, you know, with one inch, you know, pitch size. So, for example, if you have a shell with the ID di diameter of 8 inches and then one passes a square pitch with, you know, one uh, quarter square pitch and uh, one inch tube size, the maximum number of uh, tubes are 21, right? You can use these tables to find the maximum number of tubes. Now, 
he transfer coefficient for the tube size for the tube side for the tube side if there is no phase change you can use those correlation that you use to design a double pipe heat exchanger to find the nozzle number right but keep in your mind that here you need to use the um, idt for all diameters internal diameter of tube so if you have phase change if this is a you know uh, if there's any condensation or boiling, you need to use equations of chapter 10. Pressure drop. For the pressure drop uh, for the tube side. So pressure drop actually for the tube size, for the tube side um, depends on the, you know, uh, pressure drop by the tubes and also pressure drop by the sudden expansion and contraction. So you need to calculate these two different terms, add these two terms to calculate, you know, the total pressure drop. F is the friction factor. You can find it from those correlation in from uh, fluid mechanics or Moody's diagram. L is the length of, you know, tubes. NP is the number of passes. IDT is the internal diameter of tube, density, velocity, and GC is correction factor. For SI system, this is one. For the British one, is 32.2. And then this is the you know pressure drop due to sudden expansion or contraction. If you add these two terms and then combine these two equations, this will be the total pressure drop in the tube side. You need to calculate the total pressure drop, and then you need to make sure that the delta P in tube side is less than 70 kilopascal or 10 PSI. Otherwise, you need to modify your design. Okay, this is all you need to do, you know, for the tube side, to design the tube side. For the shell side, so what you need to do, you need to calculate the uh, material, you need to find the material and also baffles. So for the materials, you can use different materials. It depends on several factors, it depends on the application, it depends on the, you know, fluid properties, fluid temperatures, you know. So, but generally speaking, we can use a steel or rod iron. And so you can use, you know, table F1, you know, to just find the, uh, you know, a specification of different pipes. Baffles. You need to find the number of baffles. You know, you will see that, you know, we need to find the number of baffles and also the baffle spacing or baffle pitch. What is the baffle pitch? Baffle pitch is the distance between adjacent baffles. So, generally speaking, this distance is between 0.2 times a diameter of shell or you know a diameter of shell so you can pick a number in this range for the you know uh, baffle spacing or baffle pitch so if you just assume a value in this range for the baffle pitch and then by having the length of you know shell or tube you can simply find the number of baffles right so uh, for the baffle, you know, arrangement, you can use, you know, different arrangement. In this course, we use the segmental, you know, baffle only. So uh, for the heat transfer coefficient from the shell side, it's a little bit different, guys, from the previous, you know, equation. So you can use this equation if there is no phase change to find the nozzle number. S is, you know, for the shell, nozzle number for the shell. So keep in your mind that, guys, you need to use the equivalent diameter, correct? The equivalent diameter to calculate the nozzle number and also the Reynolds number, right? And the other thing is that here we have the Vs. What is this Vs? We will discuss this Vs. So you can use this equation to find the uh, nozzle number if there is no phase. If there is a phase change, you can use those correlation from chapter uh, 10, but Keep in your mind that here, for all, you know, diameters in those, you know, correlation in chapter 10, you need to substitute, you know, uh, for the, you need to substitute, you know, with the, the equivalent. You need to use the equivalent diameter in all those correlations to find the uh, no self number. Okay, so for the shell side, to calculate the no self number, you need to find the Reynolds S. Correct. So the Reynolds S depends on the D equivalent. 
Now, what's the definition of equivalent diameter for shell uh, side? So, to find the equivalent diameter for the shell side, it depends actually to the uh, tubes, you know, uh, configuration. So, for the S square one, if you have this, you know, arrangement, S square one, by using the definition of the equivalent, four times flow area over P heated. So, what is the flow area? Flow area is this clear, correct? You know, um, area. So, this clear area is the difference between the total area, which is ST square minus these areas, correct? And then these areas is actually the area of one, two, correct? So here you can see that the D equivalent equals to the uh, uh, S four times ST square minus this is the area of one, you know, pi. So, and the P heated is also the P of one, so if you simplify this equation you will get you know this equation for the equivalent if you use this definition guys for the d equivalent for the s per one uh this will be the equation for the d equivalent for uh shell and tube heat exchanger uh, with triangular pitch now you found the equivalent diameter correct so to find the reynolds number also you need to find the vs what is the VS? So to answer this question, and uh, what is the VS? Let's go back here, guys. Yeah, here. <coughs> Sorry. Look, guys, area is not constant. Look, so here we have the smaller area, correct? And then area here increases. So area in the shell is not constant, the flow area, meaning that the velocity is not constant. Velocity changes. Here, there is a smaller area of velocity increases. Here, there is higher velocity, so velocity is lower. So, because velocity and area changes, we need to define a characteristic area for the, you know, uh, shell, correct? The characteristic area. What is the characteristic area? Based on the definition, characteristic area is DS, C, B, or ST. DS is the diameter of shell. C is the, you know, clearance distance be between the two, you know, uh, adjacent uh, pipe. B is, uh, you know, uh, baffle spacing. And ST is the, you know, uh, pitch size, correct? So you can find the AS. Now by having the AS, you can find the VS. So VS is actually characteristic velocity for the show, which is the M dot over rho times a s now you are able to find the uh reynolds number for the shell correct you have the definition for the equivalent diameter you have the definition for the vs so you can find the nozzle number keep in your mind that for the pressure drop for the shell side uh you need to use the vs also okay so pressure drop for the shell side Pressure drop for the shell side, you can use this correlation to find, you know, the uh, pressure drop. NB is the number of baffles. DS is the diameter of shell. D is the equivalent diameter. VS is the characteristic velocity. GS, GC is the, you know, uh, coefficient. It's one for uh, SI system, 32.2 for the British one. And then to find the F by, don't use the Moody's diagram. You need to use this correlation to find f correct so use this correlation to find f so you need to calculate the pressure drop for the shell side and then you need to make sure that the pressure drop is less than 10 psi or 70 kilo pascal so here you can see you know suggested order for calculations for a shell and tube heat exchanger Again, guys, you need to start from the uh, fluid properties. You need to find the fluid properties. So uh, to find the fluid properties, you can start, you know, uh, normally exit temperatures are unknown. You can calculate the average temperature in the inlet, and then you can use that temperature to find the thermophysical properties. Then you need to find the tube size, uh, you know, shell data, you know, the DS, baffle spacing, a C and this thing, then you need to find the areas. 
then to calculate, you need to find the Nusselt number for both two fluids. To find the Nusselt number, you need to find the Reynolds numbers. To find the Reynolds number, you need to have the velocities. So calculate the velocities for both two fluids, then calculate the Reynolds number, and then you can calculate the Nusselt numbers. So by having the Nusselt number, you can calculate the heat transfer coefficient, and then you can find the overall heat transfer coefficient, and then you will be able to find the uh, you know, exit temperature. This is not the last step to design the shell and tube heat exchanger. So what you need to do, you need to find, to calculate Q for cold fluid, hot fluid, and also Q by using, you know, the log mean temperature difference method. And then you need to make sure that there is a heat tr actually transfer balance, you know, in your heat exchanger. QC equals to the QH equals to the Q by LMTD method. Also, you need to calculate F and you need to make sure that F is less than 0 0.75. If F is higher than 0 0.75, you're not good. You need to redesign your heat exchanger. And then you need to find the pressure drop for both, you know, shell and tube. And then you need to make sure that, you know, the pressure drop is less than 70 kilopascal in both two parts. So, uh, uh, this is, you know, my two-day lecture. And next, actually, for Monday, we will, I will solve one problem from the Shell and Tube Heat Exchanger. Then I will go over the plate and frame heat exchanger design. And then one problem from that part. And then we are done, you know, with this part. We can start, you know, the uh, fluid mechanic part. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, guys. And have a great day.